Okay, so I've got complete control of the situation now. I've got two <laughs> microphones <laughs> and an audience <laughs> uh, and a slideshow to organize uh, because I really want to introduce Brody uh, and welcome him uh, across here to come and talk about his project. That'd be amazing. Um, thank you, Brody. Can I hand you that? I've got you've one got microphone already. You've got, you've got I'm okay, double. Right. Two mics and the truth is what we're <laughs> going to hear now. Um, I think we've gone back to the very beginning. I think we had to. I think what we'll do is go through. Brody, where did you start? Keep going. Yeah, I can see you. After Mellow, I think. I think so too. Don't worry, we got this. Careful. The technical gods are not looking down on us. <laughs> there okay, you rock go. and roll. We're in business. Brody, thank you very thank much. You. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Johnny, and um, thank you, everyone at Messams and Oceans Rising, for having me. Um, it's been an amazing day thus far, and um, really interesting to share conversation with you and see how the arts and the sciences intermingle, um, and um, even see some people and collaborators in the past uh, here today as well. So, my name is Brody Neal. I'm a furniture designer. I originate from Tasmania in Australia, which is where this photo was taken. And the water, the sea, the ocean has always been a long... Um, uh, sorry, this is automatically going through. Can I slow it down? Sorry. Um, the water has always been uh, a big, um, I've always had a big affinity to it um, growing up, uh, as I mentioned, in, in Tasmania and its proximity to the Southern Ocean, um, and has been gone on to be a big influence on my work throughout my career. Um, I have, sorry, is it on a kind of pre... <laughs> that was like SOS. <laughs> Did you all get that? <laughs> like depth here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's automatically playing. It does, isn't it? Why is it doing that? I'm not sure. Shoot display from slideshow. If I stop it, this is play, but it's not stopping. It's not stopping it. Otherwise, this is going to be very short and very quick. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. Um, may I, may I yeah, yeah, go for it. Anyway, maybe I keep on talking. So um, uh, these these works that are coming back and forth, back and forth that, that you see, uh, it's just a really quick um, uh, glimpse of the work that I do outside of the ocean plastic, which is the core of what I'm going to speak to uh, to you about today. Um, but it shows you a little bit of background about what it, what it is that I do. And um, a lot of that work is uh, it's upcycled, it's recycled, uh, it's looking at um, salvage materials um, in different ways. You would have seen the. Can we go back? Yep. Is it is it working now? No. You all seem to want to do the. They want to keep on keep on moving. I can hold it. Let me try and pause it. Okay. <laughs> so we see you would have seen this the multi striped uh, piece. Sorry, now what we're seeing on the screen is not the same, but... Um, and uh, that was a piece that was dates back to 2008, and it was one of my first forays into um, reclaimed materials, and it was a lot of materials taken from construction sites, so it had all different types of plywoods in it. It was taken from um, workshops in my area of, um, like, sign makers, kitchen cabinet makers, all types of things, and all of those materials were then joined together uh, and machined out as one, which back then in that time was uh, was quite kind of cutting edge. You would have also seen uh, a bronze work, which is more recent, but that was something that we, um, we've done out of a recycled bronze, and it's an infinitely recyclable material. And then also there was a round table, this one, perfect timing, um, which is made out of hydro wood, which is a, a timber from Tasmania, which has been submerged since the 1970s from a valley that was flooded in order to create hydroelectricity. Now, these are all interesting stories um, uh, in their own, but we're here to talk about the ocean plastic. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That one? That's... 
You got a lot of. You got a lot of backseat drivers. No, I need a front seat driver. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep it. Yeah, you're I'm trying to keep right. it going. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. So <laughs> this is the slide. If you can land on that one, that'd be great. So, do you want to go? Yeah, these are not my words. So, you would have seen the um, slide which had um, the hand picking up the plastic from the beach. Basically, I was uh, part of an exhibition uh, at the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne back in 2015. Uh, and part of that was a um, design symposium slash camp uh, that was. Um, uh, coincidentally back in Tasmania and back on a part of Tasmania that I used to frequent as a child, uh, which is called Bruni Island, um, just south of Hobart, which is the city I grew up in. Um, and it was on this design symposium that I was literally just by myself walking along the beach um, and, and I was struck by the amount of plastic that was washed up on this shore. Now, yeah, sure, you know, like I've, I've been you know, diving in the um, Southeast Asia and swimming in the Med, and I was aware of ocean plastic. I was aware of uh, you know marine debris and everything, but this really kind of struck home because uh, you know, there's a very small population uh, in 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 Tasmania in the Southern Ocean in that part of the world. How could this material get here? How could it travel downstream? and uh, land on these shores. And here is a material um, that is uh, extracted from fossil fuels, dragged across the ocean, refined into, into, into a plastic chemical, injection molded, turned into a product used fleetingly, uh, disposed of and finds its way back in the ocean. But it's virtually an in indestructible material. And what I left, that coastline that day with this idea, not completely refined idea, but more of a kind of design challenge to think about how that material could be um, uh, captured in a circular system. How could it find its way back into being uh, something and kind of caught in this circularity? So whilst this idea kind of um, uh, matured and took shape, uh, the opportunity to represent Australia at the inaugural London Design Biennale emerged. And I thought, how better than Australia, the world's largest island, uh, to literally take uh, a leading role in the stewardships of the ocean uh, by literally bringing the issue of ocean plastic to the round table of this international design forum. And this was um, the London Design Biennale 2016 uh, at Somerset House. It had about 40 nations represented uh, and uh, we produced this, if you go, you <laughs> back here. We produced this, which was the gyro table, which was the centerpiece to that uh, installation. So if I, sorry, Tony, I if I, I'm gonna have to, a lot of hopping. So obviously, I think it's in built into it. Yeah, it's okay. Built there. Kind of like um, so obviously th this was uh, Henderson's Beach, which is not far from Point Nemo. Uh, and so my first port of call when doing the collaboration was to go to uh, back to my home university, University of Tasmania, which has a very strong um, department of um, marine and Antarctic studies, the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies where I collaborated with Dr. Jennifer Lavers, uh, who's a research fellow there, as, as well as um, here in the UK at the Natural History Museum. Uh, and she really kind of opened my eyes and uh, to the real catastrophic effects of ocean plastic around the world. Um, it was a lot more than just those few little pieces that I picked up on that Tasmanian beach. And you can see the picture of Henderson Beach, the, uh, this picture. Uh, this is a very remote island in the South Pacific, uh, and this image is easily 12 years old. Um, but you can see the amount of marine debris that's washing ashore. Then the next picture of the boy picking up the, the water, which is from Hawaii, which is an area that we've um, collaborated a lot with uh, in the time since. 
the picture was taken by Kahi Pakaro, who uh, Kali uh, knows and works with. Um, and um, you can see the amount of microplastic that's washing up on the shoreline of these areas. So we started to use this material, predominantly polypropylene, polyethylene, fragments. We have no idea how long this material has been uh, at sea, let's say, um, and working its way into a, a new material. So cast these terrazzo tiles after doing a lot of research into heat forming and shaping and all types of things that we were able to do uh, prior to that. And then, uh, as I said before, landed into the, the big blue table that you saw there, which was the gyro table, which is uh, a kaleidoscopic pattern of um, 36 lines of longitude around and across the piece to create this mosaic, which has got over, got, got over a million fragments of ocean plastic in it um, that forms these shapes. So quite quickly from there, um, uh, that really kind of took me from being a fairly I don't know, humble kind of furniture maker from the workshop into being more of a spokesperson for uh, for these issues. Obviously, you see, obviously, you know, um, public speaking and, and media appointments and things like that. I've gone on to present it at the Brussels at the European Union, the United Nations Oceans Conference in the United States, here in Wiltshire, and uh, and and on. Um, other projects that we've done is, uh, this was an installation we did at the Mi Hotel for the London Design Festival in 2017, uh, which was a drop of an ocean, which was an art, uh, a, um, art installation where a drop of water would fall over 100 feet, which is a, it's a very unique architectural space, um, Foster's and Partners Design Space, which is a, a, a triangle, you've done it? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch anything. I think I'm just going to have to keep it on this one. Um, so yeah, so this is the space. We had a drop of water fall uh, over 100, 100 feet, land in this pool of water. That would then trigger this uh, projection uh, of a roaring wave, which would happen every 60 seconds. Um, so other projects that we've done in that space um, was uh, an exhibition at Sotheby's on Bond Street in 20... Oh, it's doing it again, sorry. How did you do it? <laughs> yeah, an exhibition at Sotheby's which was called um, Material, Material um, Consciousness, which was all about uh, this, this understanding of the material and how it's moved and, and, and what it has been through to get to, to the hands and, and into these objects. So you see the green table and the, and the next two pieces, these pieces are jetsam and flotsam, which are obviously looking at the material that we're able to uh, reconstitute into, into furniture works. And, and then we have an hourglass, which we created in collaboration with some um, scientific glass blowers in South London that create amazing, um, uh, scientific equipment for all of the world leading laboratories and universities. So it's a double walled glass um, kind of capsule, uh, which literally replaces sand uh, with microplastic um, fragments, very, very small pieces, uh, because a lot of the beaches we're actually picking it up from, as you would have seen some of the images for earlier, there is literally more plastic than sand. And um, obviously, a, a message in a bottle uh, that is time is running out and it has acid etched on the top and the bottom of the piece which are the coordinates of where the material uh, has been collected and then that uh, brings us up to now um, and this was in May of this year I was invited uh, to to partake in a symposium in East Arnhem Land in the north of Australia and uh, to collaborate, similar to this, artists to collaborate with the indigenous community but also the uh, rangers of the, the this kind of vast area. Uh, and for a, for a week uh, we were on country in this uh, sacred First Nations um, land where 
it's, it is like super remote and super hard to get to. This is up in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And we, by day we would do beach, um, uh, beach cleanups and beach, beach uh, uh, visits. And you can see here that um, this is one of the ghost nets that we would, um, sorry. These are one of the ghost nets that we would uh, we, we found on one of the days that we were there. It was totaling about f about four tons in weight. It was absolutely huge and all s submerged within the uh, within the sand. And this is uh, a ghost net that had been cut free from from a fisheries. Uh, most likely travelled down from the north from Southeast Asia, down into the Gulf of Carpentaria. Uh, you can see that it's an absolute mix of amalgamation of different ropes and makeshift buoys and all types of things. Uh, and it's completely embedded within the sand. Now, unfortunately, uh, you know, these are sacred, sacred lands. These are where um, rituals and ceremonies take place. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, there is a great deal of plastic on these beaches. In regards to the ocean, in regards to the um, uh, the microplastic that we were collecting, uh, unfortunately, uh, we were finding that it bleached even further, and it, it had serious UV degradation um, to the point that it's very difficult for us to even fathom how we might be able to make something from it. Basically, if you picked it up, it would turn to powder in your hands. Um, so uh, projects that are ongoing, uh, you can see here that this is a, a, a little teaser of a detail of something that we're working on, which is um, recycled fishing nets, the nylon that uh, um, I think it was Heather spoke about earlier, uh, a material that um, we're working with recyclers to, um, uh, to, to realise something, something, something in that kind of space. Um, but... Sorry, this has been very <laughs> challenging uh, to kind of do. But anyway, um, I'm happy to kind of fulfill any kind of questions. Yeah. Um, do that. Um, I would love to, I mean, by the way, uh, 10 out of 10, guys. Yeah. Like oh, well. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is seriously beautiful. I, I always get a little bit queasy with the sort of relationship between recycled materials and kind of coming back into our ecosystem and how it's used. But this is genuinely beautiful work. It's amazing. Thank you. It's the first time you really think, like, that's something I want to encompass in my life. And it's a really amazing response to it. It's, it's stunning. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I probably skimmed through some of the process stuff earlier, but um, we, we received just sack loads uh, of this material and um, and I've been to some of the worst hit areas. I've been to the place in Hawaii, Australia, as I showed you, other places in Southeast Asia, uh, and collected it myself. I know the, you know, there's a lot of process that kind of goes into it uh, to really elevate it up there. But um, when it takes the shape, like, like the larger table kind of thing, it really kind of puts people face to face with, with the issue, and it reshapes it in that kind of context. It's really interesting, and the, the shapes you have, they reach out, I think if that's your design language, mm -hmm. in a way that you know you could adapt to any way, the sensibility of what you're doing is really reaching out to people to sort of say, look, encompassed by thought processes in there. It's very, I see it quite a lot of, a lot of Australian thinking and design, actually, it's lovely to, to see it referenced there. Thank you. Um, would anyone like to throw into the conversation on Brody and just, just like, see where we can take this? Can I just ask? Yeah, you um, how would you, how would someone eventually dispose of one of your fine pieces of furniture in a sort of ecological way? Um, you're asking how would somebody dispose of it? Um, well, uh, fortunately, a lot of these pieces actually form part of museum collections, uh, and so on. So hopefully. That day is a long way away, um, but if it did happen, um, you could well you could grind it up and and um, and and recast or reconstitute it again. Um, otherwise, you know the material that we're taking, like um, uh, I was showing someone through the studio uh, only yesterday, and and obviously we were discussing looking at all the little pieces of yet to be reconstituted ocean plastic. 
It's it's like marine debris. It's it's nurdles, which are the pre-production pellets. It's a lot from the aquaculture industry. A lot of stuff is starting to come from kind of domestic plastics. So you know you can't recycle that stuff. You know, so it really is kind of end of life. It's at such a scale that you can't divide it back into its kind of chemical compounds. Some of your uh, uh, work going back into recreating nets. Yes. Um, what keeps you coming back to art rather than just sticking to recycling? Why, why do you keep coming back to doing it in an art methodology? Uh, yeah, well, we're not creating, we're not creating fishing nets. Um, the nets are... For myself, with the with the ocean plastic, I always have seen the ghost nets as being on the holy grail, the most complicated. Even though microplastics are in in um, intensely complicated because of uh, their scale, their their diversity in what type of plastic they are, how old they are, their uh, how structurally um, kind of um, resilient they are, all of these kind of issues we have. Um, so there's a lot of trial and error that kind of goes into it. We're not looking to create the fishing nets from fishing nets. Uh, we're looking at trying to find other purposes, purposes for it. And similar to what Heather showed this morning with the carpet tiles, you know, this nylon six material is, is a very high performance plastic. Uh, and if it can find its way, literally that not be that uh, kind of mound of mess on the beach and find its way back into a circular system. We won't be need to be doing things like mining the, uh, you know, the, the, the seabed for these materials. These materials are in circulation. We just need to be smarter about how we keep them that way. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. We could touch on that a bit more, I think. Um, may I ask a question to you? Um, thank you. With your blue table, how did you sort all those little nurdles into lots of different blues? Okay. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, um, a, a really good podcast and sit there and literally kind of hand and sort it. Um, the, to land on the decision to use the gradient of, of white through blue and into black, was not only to reference our big blue planet, uh, but it was also an observation of that was, they were the colours that, that we were picking up, predominantly picking up. And that's because a lot of blue is used in, um, you think of bathroom products and even cleaning products, maybe ironically because they've got a, an affinity or some kind of connection to nature or reference to nature or water or something like that. Um, so a lot of those products uh, uh, are those color, colors, I guess, um, and they find their way, obviously, back in, in, in find their way into the ocean. So it was a take on that. Um, also, a lot of the warmer colors, um, the, the warmer UV colors, they actually fade faster. So if you actually have a look at the detail of the table, when you get a bit closer, there are those other colors, the reds, yellows, purples, uh, etc. Uh, but they have little white, halos where they've been, um, they're faded basically, uh, and then when you cut back through that to create that kind of cut concrete terrazzo lo look, then they reveal their original colour on the inside. I, I love the fact that that design element is thinking, oh God, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. I can't separate it out, but, but you can, you do, it's problem solving. I'm going to do it. Oh, right at the end. Do you source your microplastics, essentially? I don't know. Do you need me to? I think I just yeah. that. So how do you sort the microplastic? I think it's the same question. Uh, um, do, do, source, yeah, collect. Source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, we do. Um, so, yeah, due to the slides, I probably skimmed across that very, very quickly. But um, 
So as I said, my first port of call when venturing out onto this was um, working with Dr. Jennifer Lavers. She is a uh, marine biologist. Her focus mostly is uh, seabirds, um, and uh, but she's actually um, uh, looking at their intestines and what they eat, and, and you'd be shocked to see how much um, plastic there can be in a, in a bird's stomach. Um, so obviously that's affecting um, the amount of birds and the sea life, and sp specifically um, uh, shearwaters in Lord Howe Island, is, which is where her re re research mostly is. Um, and I've got bags, little bags of plastic in the studio that have been the contents of a bird's stomach. I thought that that was a bit too powerful to put into uh, a regular table, so we're saving that for something else. So she was my first port of call, and then she's really opened it up into a, to a network of people. There's a company in Tasmania called Team Clean Tasmania, and um, I've, yeah, flown around the world with suitcases full of microplastic, and um, there's an organisation in Hawaii called Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, Parlay for the Oceans, all of these kind of companies. Thank you. Thanks. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> that was not easy. And Brody, may I just ask, sorry, if you wanted to follow through on some of the images and designs, is, is there a website where we, we could follow your... Yes, yeah, so it's my name, brodyneal.com, uh, brodyneal on Instagram, and uh, yeah. Thanks. Brilliant. And Thank you very much. If you've got much. any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. <laughs> okay. Well, this is a perfect time of, in that case. So what we thought we would do is just... Um, take a 15 minute break, which we're going to uh, come back here in 15 minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to reload Tom's uh, platform and um, we'll hear from Tom and then from David as a finale about deep sea exploration. Okay, thank you. Thank you.